Okay, so I'd like to introduce to you Steve Gutierrez. Uh, Steve has been working with us for a good two, three years. Um, some unemployment issues, employment issues, some uh, legal issues. Uh, he has three children. Two are playing in the club. One is playing for Kendra. I don't, I'm not sure who the other one is playing for. Was playing volunteer for? Volunteer coaching. Volunteer coaching? What? You're volunteer coaching? I am for one day a week. Very good. Well, and seven year old, so. And, and, your, and the girl is playing for Kendra. That's right. And the other one is playing for who? No, my third is not playing anymore. No, he's he's retired. Okay. Retired at an early age. Exactly. So uh, Steve Kaderis is um, an attorney in our organization. He uh, focuses on labor and employment law, uh, and he's uh, he's going to donate uh, two hours of his time to us. Mentioned that we should do this once every six months, once a year, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, we're going to have it filmed, if you don't mind, Steve, um, so that we can. Um, go back and look at some of the things that you addressed. And plus, I thought it'd be a good idea for our partners around the country to uh, get access to this. All right. So it's all yours. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, I guess you're excited about the topic we're going to speak about today. Uh, fortunately, the, the, our benevolent leaders have passed a lot of laws that regulate the employment relationship. And so, um, because of that, uh, employers, even nonprofit organizations who have employees, are required to uh, teach their employees about the law so that we all kind of understand what's appropriate in the workplace and what's not. And so, um, as Tim suggested, um, you know, when I started doing some work for Rush, I recommended that we do uh, training on a, on a semi annual basis or, or, or annual basis. Um, I thought of this is Kendra when she was a young baby. <laughs> Just, uh, that was last year. <laughs> so anyway, we, we, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the harassment. And when you talk about harassment, uh, I've been doing litigation in this area for almost 20 years now. And I've handled uh, a number of discrimination cases um, and harassment cases. And I'll, I'll tell you, they're, they're never dull. It's amazing what uh, happens in the workplace. And so... I, I can't make it up is what I'll tell you when I tell you some stories of cases that I've had. Uh, what we want to try to understand today is really four goals uh, to help you understand the policies. The, the Rush organization has a handbook and you probably were given that handbook or should have been when you were oriented to the company. I know they're online on your system. Uh, they have policies of equal employment opportunity and, and other policies so I'd encourage you to go back and look at them. So we want to understand what the policies are here within the organization. We want to try to help each other understand what to look for. Because we all have a responsibility, even as employees, to help eliminate the risk of, of harassment. It's not good for the morale of the employees, nor is it good for the image. And of course, as you all know, what our goal ultimately is to serve the customer. Uh, we want to do that with, with, with being appropriate to each other. Uh, if you are the victim of harassment, then, of course, you want to know how to get help and what the obligations are of the, of the company with respect to harassment and what you can do to help prevent that as well within the organization. So let me give you just a, a real high-level 10,000-foot view of the law. There are really um, two sets of laws that uh, we look to in Colorado in particular. In other jurisdictions, there is a third set that comes from a county or municipality. Um, and so by way of example, Federal law doesn't protect against um, discrimination against a transgender or against sexual orientation. Uh, the, uh, Congress has been trying for years to pass a law. They have not been able to do that. So there is no prohibition against discrimination against tran transgender or folks based upon the, the individual's sexual orientation. Um, Colorado doesn't have that law either. But there are 39 or more cities that have laws that prohibit uh, that type of discrimination. So um, you, you can understand that ju the jurisdiction of various government entities depends upon what that entity has tried to do to regulate the employment relationship. In Colorado, most of our cities don't have those kinds of laws except for the city and county of Denver, which passed some uh, laws uh, re regulating. Um, they were the first city to do a smoker, smoker's bill of rights and they do have uh, some other laws that regulate the employment relationship. So, uh, 
Of course, what we look to when we're dealing with employment claims is Colorado law, and for the most part, Colorado law will mirror federal law. Uh, remember, the federal government pioneered civil rights laws in the 60s and passed Title VII uh, in 1964, and that law was um, really duplicated in most states uh, throughout the late 60s and early 70s so that every state had the, its own anti-discrimination law in place as well. So the, the language of the statutes are almost the same. The remedies under the statute are different. And so Colorado law, for instance, doesn't give a right to a jury trial, whereas federal law does. So we look at what the, the, the laws are for purposes of understanding what our rights are. And it can be Colorado law, it could be the city and county of Denver law, or it can be uh, federal law. Of course, they're made by our legislatures, and they're enforced by agencies that have been created to help uh, enforce those laws. So in the, on the federal level, what's the one agency you probably all know about in the civil rights area? The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, they also have the United States Department of Labor, and the Department of Labor is responsible for child labor, family and medical leave, wage and hour. So and anything that falls within those three things will be under the Department of Labor. Uh, Title VII is under the EEOC. Okay. In the state, we have this, the State Civil Rights Division, and we also have the Colorado Department of Labor. And it really breaks down about the same, although the state of Colorado doesn't have the family medical leave statute. So. Can I have the first question? Yes. Sorry, I interrupted. No. In, the, in case of conflict, who, who is, the, is the one that will enforce the law? I mean, the federal law or the state law? It, it's it's going to depend. Um, you, you may remember from constitutional law, we do have the right for each state to be independent of the federal government, uh, the Tenth Amendment. Um, generally speaking, when it's uh, the in fact, it's a great question, by the way. Um, the Patient Protection Act, Obamacare, the big question that was debated constitutionally was whether the federal government had the right to regulate uh, conduct within the states. And many of the states sued on the basis of the Tenth Amendment, claiming that you couldn't interfere with what was within the jurisdiction of the state. The Supreme <coughs> Court said because the Commerce Clause gave com Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce, um, the, uh, the, the law was constitutional, although the, the Supreme Court did say that it was an overstepping on the, and I'm, I'm not an expert in that, that case, but it was an overstepping in part, uh, it violated the, the state's indiv individual rights under the Tenth Amendment because the Commerce Clause was, did not allow them to go beyond um, or in the breadth of that statute. So that's, a, that's an example, probably not an artful way because I didn't study that it's a little outside my area. But in this context, in the employment context, Title VII uh, applies if you're subject to the jurisdiction of the law. And to, get, to be subject to Title VII, you need to have 15 or more employees. So not very many uh, to be subject to it. There's not a, uh, an amount of money in commerce that's required for you to be subject to the law. So Title VII will apply if you have 15 or more employees. If you're less than 15, Colorado law applies. Uh, now again, the remedies under these two statutes are, are very unique and different, which is uh, something that the Colorado legislature has been uh, fighting about for years. They want to broaden them to, to mirror the federal remedies. You, you have very limited remedies under state law, uh, so you can't get as much money if you were to go to court and, and litigate this kind of a claim. So uh, what are the employment discrimination laws? Um, I mentioned civil rights laws, and when I, what I mean by civil rights laws, because we kind of put all of these under that, that umbrella, uh, civil rights laws really were the, the first foray by the federal government into trying to break uh, discrimination in the South. And they passed um, laws that regulated the ability of a private citizen to enter into a contract. So to go to a hotel and stay at a hotel, they really were designed to, to target segregation in the South. So those are uh, laws that don't generally apply in this context. Uh, but we do have Title VII for private employers, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Jurisdiction under that statute is uh, if you're over 40, you have protection under that law. We have the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which was amended just a couple of years ago. In fact, I believe it was the, one of the first federal laws uh, signed by the current president. Uh, the Family Medical Leave Act. We have the Equal Pay Act, which got a little notoriety yesterday in one of the speeches at the 
convention, the Lilly Lead Better Fair Pay Act that comes out of the Equal Pay Act. We have laws that prohibit retaliation that, that are really uh, attached to almost every single statute. And so what that means is if you came and complained about discrimination or you were a witness in a proceeding of discrimination, you're protected by law. They're really whistleblower laws. So we ha there, you have the right to, if you saw an unfair, a, a business practice that you thought was uh, a violation of law and you complained and you were fired, there's a, there's a, a remedy for you under a variety of different retaliation statutes. Um, <coughs> we do have laws for citizenship and uh, you know, they, they really target all of these things, uniform services for our veterans, uh, sex uh, comes out of Title VII, and Title VII really is the big one. It has religion, uh, sex, so based on gender, um, and out of that came the laws that prohibit harassment based on gender, and that's a little bit of a, uh, a court cr creature, uh, and I'll explain that as we get, get to that later. Um, and so we look at Title VII mostly because that's where the, the, the majority of claims that are filed under the Title VII come out of. So religion, uh, national origin, race, uh, gender. Those are your major discrimination claims. So when I looked at uh, the Russian employee handbook, the, the key provisions of the handbook that uh, you ought to look for are the open door guideline, the equal employment opportunity provision, the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, harassment uh, prohibited, and then of course the complaint procedure that uh, has been adopted by the club to complain. So you might ask yourself why it really matters to you, and the, the really, as I said in my introductory comments, it matters because it it creates a better place for everyone to work if we do things the right way and we treat people with dignity and respect. Um, it protect, protects safety and productivity, and of course, most importantly, from the lawyer's point of view, um, it reduces the risk to the club uh, because these cases can be significant. Um, you know, there are, there are, I've, I've lost uh, over a million dollars in a sexual harassment case. Uh, so it was a highly compensated executive who suffered for years uh, sexual harassment. And uh, the organization lost $1.5 million at a jury trial. And so you can see just that's a single plaintiff. Um, you know, all the cases are different. Average verdicts are much less than that. So I kind of rung the bell there for that client, but uh, the facts were pretty egregious in that case. So you can see it, that it, it does matter to the organization. Of course, that kind of uh, judgment on an organization like this is very, very significant. And uh, if the company can't pay, then we all lose out, I think, at the end of the day. So um, can you ever be personally liable is the other component, and the answer is yes, you can. Uh, there are, um, under Title VII, you cannot be personally liable because each of you individually are not employers. The organization is an employer. And um, under agency theories, uh, vicarious liability, uh, the courts have said there is no individual liability under Title VII. So you don't have liability there. But what generally happens in a case is uh, the smart plaintiff's lawyer will sue the company um, and they'll also sue the alleged harasser or discriminator. And they get to them, not under Title VII, but they get to them under various state tort claims that uh, they complete. Um, so some of the things that come up, and these are usually attached to so can I discrimination claims. Yes. Before you start explaining what those are, when you say, can you, can you be personally liable, you meaning the individual who yes. did the potential criminal act? or That's right. The, the, that that individual, not the employee, you, the employer, you. Right. To be clear, um, all of you as employees, when you engage in conduct in the course and scope of your employment, can cause liability for the organization. So if you're driving down the road on rush business and you get in a car accident, there's an agency theory that attaches liability to the company. It's the very same thing in the context of the employment laws. If you do something during the course of your employment, like harass someone, then you uh, can impose liability in the organization. Now, if it's purely harassment or discrimination, are you individually liable for that? The answer is no, because 
Title VII deals with employer and employee. And you can't sue under Title VII an individual harasser. But you can sue an individual harasser or discriminator under state tort theories. So if I went down and smacked Ross right now, and I hurt him, he could sue me for criminally for assault. But if I say I knocked some teeth out, he could also sue me for the damages that that physical conduct caused under tort theories, right? There's a tort of assault and battery. So he could sue me there. So in the context of an employment relationship, what are the claims that you individually can be liable <coughs> for? And I was gonna, what I'm going to do now is list the types of claims that I see being brought against the discriminator or harasser. And since uh, most of the occasions, about 95% of the time, the company is aligned with the employee because the employee denies that they engaged in the wrongful conduct, I end up defending the employee as well. So I've had this experience in that context. Yes, Tim. So this is, re this is really important here that there's kind of two groups of employees in here. One um, sitting next to me, Jan, you know, she shuts off at 4 o'clock, she goes home, and she's done working. Now, you know, it's obviously, you know, she, she leaves the uh, building here, and she's no longer under the kind of umbrella of the, uh, of the club. Now, I look, the gentleman in front of me here, he goes on a road trip with, uh, you know, your daughter, and, and um, okay, they got training, they go through their games, but now he goes that night to a bar. And acts inappropriately, or maybe he just, maybe he doesn't. When does he cross over of not being an employee anymore? When do I say, Jair, you're fired. That is inappropriate. Or he's, you know, he's, you know, looking for a date, or, you know, inappropriately. Where, where does it cross over for these coaches? Because some of these guys say that I work 24 hours a day. I never shut off. Well, it, it, the club has a unique legal issue that, um, to answer your question, I'm going to jump into a different topic because the, the uniqueness of this club is that some of the folks, especially the coaches, are independent contractors. And as an independent contractor, you're not an employee of the organization. So if you're harassed by an employee of Rush, but it's solely an independent contractor. So by way of example, if it's only a coach but not someone who operates as an employee, and I think there are some of you that are dual coaches and uh, employees. But let's, let's use the example of an independent contractor who's only a coach for the league but not an employee. We don't, if that person harasses someone, we would argue that they're not our agent. They're not our employee, so he can't, there's no remedy for them uh, against the organization and no liability for their conduct because they're not acting with, they can't be our agent when they're not our employees. Now, the, qu the question, of course, would be legally whether they are independent contractors or not, um, but we would take the position they're independent contractors. So if the independent contractor is the harasser, in, as your example suggests, and they go out and harass a Rush employee, and the Rush employee says, Tim, the independent contractor harassed me at this game, you have no liability under Title VII to the employee because the employee is not discriminated in the course of their employment. Uh, of course, you can terminate the independent contractor relationship because if it's between Rush and them, although I think in our circumstance, that coach is always employed by the team. So the team could terminate that relationship. Um, but there wouldn't be liability in that context. If it's an employee, however, I think your question is when do you cross over between being a representative of the organization and not. And I would submit to you that in that context, probably going to the bar is what I'll call motivated by his individual desire, not as a representative of the organization. So when he drives to the tournament, when he engages his team, <coughs> say at a dinner function or at the games, once the evening is closed and he goes from there to the bar, he, lo he leaves the agency of the employment relationship. Does that make sense to you? It does. It, it is not a um, bright line, unfortunately. In fact, um, there, there, there's litigation of, under agency theories all the time over um, 
people when they leave the course and scope of employment. So I gave you the example where you're driving down the road on company business. Well, if, if I tell you, go drive down the road and pick up a box of uniforms, and you go down the road and you take a right to go home for five minutes, and then you come back to the road and you go down and get the uniforms, but you get an accident on that de detour, are you within the course and scope of your employment? And the answer is probably not, because that's a detour, right? So that's the best example that I can give you of when someone detours out. When you apply it in our circumstance, the going to the bar is the detour. You could argue that, you know, functioning with your team at a post-tournament dinner is not within the course and scope, although there's a counter-argument to that, and that is you're still a representative of the organization. Maybe a better example is um, we give you Bronco tickets, and you go down to the Bronco game and get intoxicated and make a fool of yourself, but you're wearing all your Rush gear, and it's a Rush-sponsored tailgate. You still have the right as an employer to regulate that person's conduct. And so we could terminate them for that, even though it's really not technically on duty kinds of conduct that that agency relationship might lie. So, hope that makes sense to That's you. That's very good. Steve, yes. can I, uh, sorry, if, if the No, no, please ask as many as questions as well. you want. Um, obviously, I look after volunteer coaches, so mm -hmm. how does this, because uh, they're not. They're neither independent contractors nor employees of, of the club. So how does the uh, where do they fit into to this? Where's that? Yeah, the, the the beauty of that relationship is we would have no legal um, relationship of an employer employee. Okay, so if if the question you're asking is what happens when a volunteer coach engages in wrongful conduct, mm -hmm. then we have the discretion as the responsible arm to the team to go in and separate that relationship. Okay. Right. We, don't, we don't have to tolerate someone's inappropriate conduct. Um, can we be liable for what that person does if that person was to harass a parent, uh, you know, God forbid, do something inappropriate with one of the kids? We wouldn't have liability there because that they're a volunteer coach, right? But if you ever, I mean, the best advice to all of us is if we saw a volunteer coach do anything that was inappropriate in any way whatsoever, I mean, I think we have a moral duty, not a legal duty, but a moral duty to intervene and do things, do what's right to, you know, eliminate that person from being in this organization. And I do think we take on some of that responsibility because we all do uh, background checks as volunteer coaches. That's okay. correct. Right. So um, that, I think that's appropriate. <laughs> Once you, you know, uh, get the background test result back if you saw something like you know the person's a registered sex offender and we let that person coach then we would have liability we would have tort liability under a negligence theory because we knew the person had a possibility of because they were a sex offender of harming someone so we would have liability in that context okay. so what are the other claims well there, there are a couple of different claims let me just throw them all out here um, that I see frequently, and one of them is uh, defamation. We all, I think, know what defamation is. If you say something negative about an individual, you can be liable. In the context of, the, of Title VII, if I said you're a sexual harasser, then that that accusation hurts his reputation, right? So he could sue me as the accused in defamation. Um, the, the most frequent example is the, her, the victim comes forward and complains of harassment and the accused then starts to defame the victim in the context of the investigation. So they get sued for whatever they say. The, the best advice to everyone in the context of defamation is be careful what you say. If you say something that's negative about an individual, it, you know, uh, used to be, although probably not today, but uh, there are two, two types of defamation. Let me step back. There's defamation per se, and there's defamation per quote. And what th those are two legal distinctions. Per se defamation is if I said to uh, you, you have HIV, the, the, the use of that statement directed to him has an um, automatic defamatory umbrella that it places over him. We, we immediately kind of go, 
that means we can he's presumptively been harmed. If I say something not directly to him, I think he's unethical. Right? At first it's a matter of opinion, so it's privileged. So it's not probably defamation. Uh, but it's not the same as accusing him of, of being a criminal. You, you've, you're a thief. That immediately lowers the esteem that you have for him in the community, right? So there's presumptive defamation. You're a sexual uh, harasser. You, you need more facts to, to know whether Ross is a sexual harasser or not, but we see a lot of defamation. So in the context of the employment relationship, you just be careful what you say about someone. Don't say something that's going to demean someone. And if you follow the rules of treating everyone with dignity and respect, you could never be personally liable for defamation. Uh, defamation is a very common claim, but not one that we usually use, uh, lose on. Uh, frankly, what happens is I think lawyers tend to throw as many claims as they can, hoping that they get one or two to stick when they go to trial. Um, and that ensures them getting to trial because they know that uh, once they get there, it's, the, the, it's really rolling the dice for them. Uh, infliction of emotional distress. What that is is a tort claim. And so you know what tort claims are. We have statutory claims, laws that prohibit discrimination, and we have torts. You've heard of those. You may not know what they are, but what, what they come from, their origin comes out of what is known as the common law. Uh, when the, the British settled the United States, they brought with them lots of laws that weren't on books. They weren't passed by legislatures. They were laws created by the courts that protected people's right to, to own property, uh, that protected someone from you know the assault example that I gave earlier. We wanted to protect people's personhood. And so uh, when our government formed, they kept the common laws uh, from, from the British, and we have a whole list of, uh, of claims that are recognized uh, claims for relief where you can sue someone for tort, but they're not on the books. You don't see this in the, the Colorado Revised Statutes or the Federal, the federal Register or the, um, the Federal uh, Court Reporters. You, you see the common laws come out of all the opinions in the, in the courts over the history of the country. So infliction of emotional distress is one of them. If I do something to purposely cause emotional distress to you, uh, then you could be individually liable. Uh, best example of this kinds of, kind of case where someone actually won is a manager that came in and berated an employee um, racially in front of the staff in an open pit area like this for months. Um, no one said anything. Uh, the employee complained and ultimately was fired. And they, of course, sued for discrimination, and there were lots of n nasty racial epithets that were said by this uh, manager. And the manager was sued individually for intentional infliction of emotional distress because the, the theory under that claim is you did something knowing that you were going to ca cause harm, and it was so relentless for so many months that the person did, in fact, suffer depression and, and uh, was ultimately awarded money. So um, that's a common claim that we see, um, and you individually could be held liable uh, for that. False imprisonment during an investigation is uh, something also that is common, and that is whenever you uh, undertake an investigation, if I called you into my office and I uh, closed the door behind you and sat in front of you and wouldn't let you get up, you could sue me for false imprisonment. Um, I used to, when I was prosecuting 20 years ago, I used to get a lot of these claims in the shoplifting context where the, the kid would get nabbed and get put in a back room and uh, would allege that they weren't being allowed to, to leave. So if you're ever a witness to an investigation or a party uh, you know, responsible for conducting an investigation, uh, always make it that, one, you have a witness, and two, you don't, if the person says, I don't want to participate anymore, um, you let them leave. You, they, you don't have a right to hold them. And once the person leaves, then you can fire them for not cooperating without ever finding whether they did the uh, uh, false imprisonment or without a finding whether they did the harassment or not. Uh, retaliation. That uh, obviously is um, one I mentioned earlier. They're, they're attached to many of the laws. Title VII has a retaliation provision in it. 
Uh, we have a policy at Rush that, that prohibits retaliation. And so if you are a witness or uh, you're the one who made the accusation, even if it, it turns out to be false, uh, you can, you're still protected against retaliation. Uh, a common question that comes up is if I make it up and I, I lodge the complaint and knowing that it's false, am I protected against retaliation? And the answer is yes in the context of, the, of Title VII. But as an employer, we can still terminate the person for maliciously making up a false, a falsehood. Uh, of course, the problem is proving that the person knew what they were saying was intentionally false. Um, assault and battery, also a common one, especially in the sexual harassment context, because there's usually a physical, generally speaking, physical touching of some sort. It doesn't have to be physical touching to be an, to be an assault uh, and battery. Um, but you can be individually liable for your conduct in that regard. And then finally, negligence. Uh, negligence is, again, is a tort law. Best example, you're driving down the road 100 miles an hour, you run a red light, you hit someone. I think you all agree in this room that you are responsible for any of the damage you cause. You have a duty not to do that. So negligence is based upon a duty. Uh, do you have a duty to protect? Another example, we have a duty to protect the kids. Uh, against harm by volunteer coaches because we undertake to organize the team. If we find out that, that uh, we had a sex offender that we just overlooked on the background check and they had a sex assault against one of the children, we would have a, a claim under negligence and uh, we'd get sued. So those are some, some tort theory. Um, and in some states you can be sued under what they call civil sexual harassment. Um, but. We don't have that in Colorado. Now, I, I, I wanted just to, to mention the philosophy of the organization, um, and I think this is in a number of different places in your company documents, but again, the, 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 the real rub here is to go back and look at your policies, because they, they do say a lot of things, and they, they are there for a reason. But we want, of course, ultimately an environment where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. Because that, if we have that kind of environment, then we're not going to ever be sued for discrimination and harassment. Okay. Now, uh, the sexual harassment policy at 2.3, uh, it's actually much lo longer than this, but I just pulled uh, uh, the key provisions. It's a zero tolerance policy, and that means if the company were to determine that you engaged in sexual harassment, you'd be terminated. Um, without question. So uh, we often use zero tolerance policies in this area. Um, if, however, the company was unable to conclude that you in fact did engage in sexual harassment, then you m might not be terminated, but I'm certain that you would be subject to some form of discipline uh, for engaging in inappropriate conduct. So let, let's talk a little bit of, about harassment, um, but get some myths out of the way. Only women can be victims of sexual harassment. Does anyone believe that anymore? No? Okay. Um, the person who is being harassed is the only victim. What do you think? There are other victims uh, that um, are around. The people who may witness it suffer with that guilt of caring, not reporting, not helping their friends. So, um, Harassers are preoccupied with sex. Uh, generally speaking, um, in, especially in the sexual harassment context, this is generally a myth that we see a lot of jurors uh, speak about when we voir dire. Um, sexual harassment is almost never about sex. It's generally about power. And so it, it has nothing to do... Um, they, they, I, I think the... Vic, the, or the person who's engaging in the harassment picks their victim, generally it's a person of the opposite sex by, by percentage, but it doesn't always have to be. Uh, only harassment uh, based on gender is unlawful. Okay. The answer is this is yes and no. Um, harassment under Title VII, what's prohibited is discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, religion, gender. Okay? 
And so harassment based on any of those protected statuses is illegal. If I'm generally an uncivil jerk to you, it's not illegal. It, you have to be able to prove that you were motivated out of one of the protected issues, gender, religion, uh, national origin, or race. Does that make sense to you? So we can have a civility code within the organization that says we're going to all treat each other with dignity and respect, but only harassment that's based upon one of the legal criteria is, is actually Ill, unlawful and illegal. Uh, crude language is protected by the First Amendment. So if I run around and drop F-bombs here and there, is that, uh, can I say I'm protected by the First Amendment? You think yes? Anyone else? No? No. No. I say no. Yeah. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we're a private organization. We don't. We're not subject to the laws set forth uh, in the Constitution, right? So, um, if we want to discipline someone for using crude language, we can. Uh, again, we can pass civility codes, and so you don't have the right to speak your mind like you would in the public domain, where the police couldn't cite you for, uh, you know, using crude language, although they might under disorderly conduct statutes, and there, there is where the fight generally lies in the criminal context, is um, what you s said uh, protected by the First Amendment. But for private employers, no. Before you move on to the next slide, it, is it possible for us to hire a female only? Because, or could I hire, say I'm inner city and we have um, lots of Latinos, and I, I advertise, we're looking for Spanish-speaking, Latino origin, is that discriminatory? Or I'm um, hiring a female because we need somebody that's a good role model for the 12 through 9-year-old girls. The answer, it's again, it's going to depend. You can tell I've been trained as a lawyer, right? Not to, not to give a good answer, but uh, it's going to depend because if there's a legitimate reason that's a bona fide legitimate reason, uh, for having that kind of criteria, um, then it's it's likely legal. I think the, the but you can't. Um, you gave two examples: the inner city person, um, where you want someone that's Latino and Spanish speaking. I submit to you that that probably is discriminatory, because you you could advertise that preference is for Spanish speaking because. Many, many people speak Spanish. What that's going to do as a matter of practical approach is you're probably going to get a lot of Latino applicants anyway. Uh, but to set forth a, a job requirement that's based upon one of the protected statuses, um, and na that's national origin or race, um, I think is illegal. The other example is may not be illegal because if you had a specific gender-specific kind of hiring criteria. Um, Hooters has a hiring criteria, right? And they generally want attractive women that are willing to, to wear the skimpy clothes. That is legal, okay? It, it's been found to be a bona fide legal require or bona fide legal job limiter that, that you could put in place. And I, so I could see maybe a little gray area in your, your second example. A woman coaching a girls soccer team may be appropriate for some legitimate reason. I'd be careful about doing that. Um, you know, the, be the better part of valor is to take an applicant pool and pick the best qualified applicant regardless of your goal. But, if, but I could see in the women's context maybe a little more gray for us to argue that that's legitimate. They're pretty close. All right, so what is unlawful harassment? Uh, two types of harassment, uh, which are broken down into these two categories, environmental harassment and economic harassment. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk about what, what are the four elements of those, of those claims. One is for anything to be harassment has to be unwelcome. And so this is one of the bigger areas of litigation, whether you have unwelcome sexual harassment. 
the first defense in a, a sexual harassment case generally by the accused is it was consensual. If it's consensual and it truly is consensual, you can't be harassing someone, right? So if you have employees who engage in a consensual relationship, it's not, a, it's not illegal, all right? So if you had a romantic relationship with a, a coworker, um, doesn't create liability. It's not a good idea, right? And why is it not a good idea? Because what happens with most relationships that, I mean, that you hope that it goes on for a long time, but when it breaks, then the friction begins, and then harassment can uh, occur. So when, when we get in that circumstance, it's a lot messier for us, but the key element of environmental harassment is <coughs> it's unwelcome. Um, so how do you know if the potential offensive conduct is unwelcome? We look, when we do investigations, we, not everyone can tell, you know, if you're, if you're a good-natured, humorous person and you start to joke with someone, how do you know when it's unwelcome? Well, the first thing you might look at is the expression of the person that the conduct is directed to, because that's an indicator of whether that person views it as welcome or not. Um, body language, another, one, another form of expression, we look to body language the mannerisms, uh, verbal response or lack of one. Not everyone who is being harassed is going to have the wherewithal to say, no, don't do that. Okay? So understand that, again, because it's the, the accused usually harasses someone that they can pick on, they choose someone who they don't think is going to say, say something in response. So we had uh, unwelcome. Um, I have here sexual conduct or directed at a protected category. Um, so again, you can have racial harassment, national origin <coughs> harassment, religious harassment, and sexual harassment based on one's gender. So that, that is the next criteria. It has to be based on one of the protected categories. Um, man, I have, you like the way I created this PowerPoint? Very nice. That was pretty cool, huh? The harassment is not just about sex, so here are um, the protected categories. I threw in sexual orientation <laughs> because I think um, the day has come for us to create policies that protect against sexual orient orient orientation and discrimination on that basis. So we can, um, you asked a question, which law trumps which law. If we as a private employer create an obligation like it will prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation, then we've created a duty to prohibit that discrimination, even though it's not mandated by law. So that's a little bit of a rub on that. Uh, we have disabilities, age. Um, so again, you can harass someone based on their disability or their age and, and be liable under that statute that protects them. Um, and then, of course, there, there are many others. So, uh, directed at a protected category or sexual in nature, one of the things that, if we look at the, the victim and we say, is this unwelcome, what are the indicators of the, the, the gestures you might look to? And of course, the most obvious one is, is physical um, conduct between the, the victim and the accused. Brushing of the body, uh, shoulder massages, hugging, uh, blocking someone's exit, um, and then, of course, obviously, sexual activity or sexual assault. There are also verbal harassments don't necessarily require the, the physical. Uh, most commonly, sexual comments, innuendos, jokes, uh, cat calls, suggestive sounds, um, you know, asking for a date and then getting rejected frequently and continuing to ask is, a, is also the, uh, harassing, asking questions about dating or one's sex life. So these are all themes from cases that, that I've handled where I've seen, you know, what is the, the, the type of conduct that is in, the person's engaging in. We see most notably today, of course, is you know, texting and uh, messages. And my advice to, to everyone is if, if you're going to text, make sure that what you text is something that you are going to be comfortable with it being seen publicly because it has a digital life as long as it's, it's saved. So uh, now what are um, 
nonverbal forms of harassment. Um, I, I pulled the Sports Illustrated calendar, uh, or, and you, you can see the calendar every February. They have a, usually uh, this type of photo on it. Uh, it. Now, at first blush, we might say, well, that's something you can buy in the, in the public domain. It shouldn't be harassing, but uh, it can be if it's offensive to someone such that it's unwelcome, it's of a sexual nature, then it can be a form of harassment. And so if someone says to you, you know, hey, that calendar of, we don't see this as much, but we did, you know, 15 years ago where people had the, the calendars of, of women in their workspaces, uh, that doesn't happen as much today. So, but just be mindful that, you know, cutting out pictures and doing stuff like that could be a uh, could be a, a form of harassment. I actually had a video clip in here, but I couldn't get it to work anymore from The Office, where, um, and I, I never watched the sitcom. I only picked it up on YouTube, but uh, they were, the, the gentleman who's the, the lead actor was giving sexual harassment training, and he starts, starts talking about the, uh, this, this guy having a pinup, and, he says, and we can't have that pinup of that girl over there in that sexually explicit dress. And, the guy looks at him and says, well, that was my daughter, and she's going to a Catholic school. It's really funny. So I was going to show you that clip, but I couldn't get it to work. So, um, so uh, other nonverbal forms, you know, you can have the magazine there, engaging harassment, winking, leering at someone, um, looking a person up and down, the elevator eyes, uh, gestures, with, you know, one's hands are all nonverbal forms of harassment. So unwelcome, it's directed at a protected category. It's offensive to the recipient and to a reasonable person. And what that means is uh, it has to be offensive. You know, a, a single suggestive statement to someone, you're attractive, doesn't constitute harassment. Okay? It, it may be unwelcome. If you to say to me that's unwelcome and that's what I said, I don't have liability for that statement, nor would the company. If I continue to make those kinds of comments, then we start to get to the to, to the we're creating an offensive type of relationship, and so that's really what the law is looking to prohibit. You know, uh, it's not wanting everyone to walk on eggshells and be too politically correct, although we're tending that way, I think. Because out of an abundance of risk, protection, and caution, um, so you can make statements and say, "Hey, you, you you look nice today." Those those aren't offensive. They may be to some, but um, but I think you know, just be mindful that once you make a statement, if you get an indication through the reaction that you get from the person you've said the statement to, that it's unwanted. You don't want to start tre trending down towards making it offensive. It, it has to be offensive to the re, to the recipient of the of the conduct and to the reasonable person. And that what that is is a protection against the person who maybe has oversensibility to the comments. Um, again, it's not a civility code, but we don't want someone who is, you know, on this fringe, that every comment is offensive to them. When nine out of ten would say, "Well, that's not an offensive comment," right? So we, the law is going to look to, it's going to create an artificial reasonable person and put a reasonable person next to you and say, would this reasonable person also be offended by the comments? And then it has to be severe or pervasive. And that means that the, it has to be continuing conduct. The isolated, one-off, inappropriate comment about someone's race or national origin or some sexual joke that you've said in the workplace isn't severe or pervasive. It has to continue over the course of time. Every case is different. <coughs> there isn't a litmus test for me to give. And so um, remember the perspective of the recipient. Uh, interesting study that I pulled, and that is when asked a specific question um, about one's looks, men reacted much less sensitive to women. And so the, the moral there, of course, is that men may think it's appropriate to say certain things in the workplace, and women tend to get, at a higher level, offended. So again, the, the, the rule here is you've got to re reduce the likelihood that you're creating that kind of environment by watching what you say and, and being appropriate in the workplace. 
And that was the question, being propositioned in the workplace is offensive. Um, and that's the, the survey result. Um, so over 70% of the women said yes. Being asked out on a date or proposition in the workplace would be offensive to me, whereas men said no. Um, so I've, I've created a, a scale of harassment. And the, the purpose of this is just to kind of exemplify it for you. If we meet the criteria of the severe and pervasive, it's offensive, it's based on a protected category, and it's unwelcome, uh, does it have to be on this scale to be illegal? And the answer is there is no scale of liability like this that I could put in place and say, okay, this type of conduct is going to be a five on that scale. If it's anywhere in those, it meets those four criteria, it's illegal, regardless of what any poll in the room might indicate. Um, you know, if we were to ask 20 people, was this conduct offensive? And 19 out of 20 said no. As long as it's a reasonable person and the recipient is offensive, it's severe and pervasive, it's unwelcome, and it's based on a protected category, there is no scale of harassment. It, it is illegal. So, again, how much is too much? It doesn't matter. It's all too much if it's illegal. Um, so let's look at the other form of harassment. Uh, this is what we call economic harassment. And it, it gets into the issue of, of agency. Uh, managers in an organization have a unique um, position because, of course, a company is an artificial being created under the law. Managers are the agents of the organization. And so if, I, as a manager, I engage in harassment, um, the company is presumed, as a matter of law, to know what my conduct is. And it's strict liability. It's very unique in, in the law. So if you have managerial harassment at a supervisory level, someone who has independent discretion and authority, has the ability to hire and fire and discipline, and can affect that person's employment. And this is why we call it economic harassment, because the managers tend to have the ability to affect a tangible employment action, a demotion, a raise. Um, they can change the terms and conditions of one's employment. Then it's strict liability for an organization. So it's the greatest form of risk um, where a manager engages in economic harassment. So a cu couple... Yeah. Could you give a little bit more example on that one? I'm not sure I quite am. I think everybody in here is somewhat of a manager, even though they're they're managing part-time, you know, contractual people. Mm -hmm. So how would that relate to Mike Pesercio sitting in front of you there with some of his coaches? And, you know, his coaches. It's, it's kind of putting a, uh, you know, a red peg in a square hole, a round peg in a square hole, because... This organization is really unique when it comes to analyzing the legal liability right. because he's Mike's going to be uh, supervising independent contractors, right? Right. Most likely, yes. Okay. They're not our employees. Okay. So um, I'm not sure that he technically falls within what I'll call that supervisory level. He's got to have the ability to affect an employee's terms and conditions of employment. So, in, in other words, the economic side of that relationship. So if he has that re ability... Hey, you're paying me $6,000 a year or $10,000 a year, and you're discriminatory you know, against me. Right, but in the context of the coach, the volunteer coaches or the independent contractors, they're not employees. So he can't engage in harassment of... An, because Title VII says an employer and an employee, right? So your first defense in that case is that whatever he did, even if it constitutes harassment, it's not illegal under Title VII. It probably subjects him to a tort claim. So his coach goes, goes up, this happens all the time, it's not a big story here, starts talking to a mom, harassing her, and... Um, because he says, I right, listen, that's enough. I told you twice, you're done, you're fired, you're no longer coaching in the club. Because he's not an employee, it doesn't fall into this category. That's right. Okay. Yes. Well, now, we, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, can we get an example then with the, an obvious one is, is Tim, who uh, ultimately is a supervisor of 
uh, the, the employees in here. Um, and let's take this uh, harassment component out of it. J just trying to clarify the, the economic um, component there. And so he would be well within his right to say, um, need to, even if it's outside the scope of a, uh, my job, you need, to, you need to shovel this pile of rocks and move it five yards over. If you don't do it, then you're going to be demoted. It, it's got nothing to do with, with my job. Right. He, he, but he's loving, he's saying, he's looking for a way to demote me. Is, is that in, in this neighborhood at all? Or? Well, the answer is no, it's not in the neighborhood. I mean, Tim, Tim would have the right to direct you in the course and scope of your employment. So if moving the rock pile five yards to the left is something that you've been employed to do, he can direct you to do that. You may not like it, but he has the right to direct you in the course of your employment. If he engages in harassment against you because of your gender, okay, and he does things to you because of your gender, that's protected, right? And you have to prove that there has to be a nexus between the harassment and the protected category. And it has to be unwelcome and severe and pervasive, right? So if all of those things were proven, then it would be illegal, and it would be a form of economic harassment using that, that nomenclature because he can affect the terms and conditions of your employment. He can demote you. He can give you a raise. He can fire you. And so th that's a clear form of your supervisor. If he engages in harassment, we have a strict liability problem. But again, in order to prove that kind of claim, you'd still have to get through all the other elements of the claim. Does that make sense? It does. And if you don't mind, let me go back to the Mike Pusercio scenario. He can, he can release a coach for pretty much any reason he wants now, because there is no, there is no handbook that he, they adhere to. They're independent contractors. He can release them tomorrow because they're playing. They're playing with a, a square ball versus a round. He can release them at any time without That's right. any legal. Okay. Right. And whether it's whether it's sexual harassment, he believes he's you know inappropriate. He can he can he can do what he wants. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously in that in the in that latter example, it should be an immediate separation. Right. But you're it's like you're we were talking about the plumber earlier. It's like you bring a plumber into your place and you don't like the way they look. You don't have to let them finish the job. You just say, boom, you're gone. And we and you're not their employer, right? It's the same with an independent contractor. You have the right to control the quality of the job. And we have a philosophy within the organization. If that coach isn't coaching with the rush philosophy, then get rid of them. Right? Let you, me stand you, let me let me stand this one more time because I think every coach in here, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric is a coach by trade, they're an employee, but now Mike Pesorcio is allowed to coach two teams because it supplements their income. Now we slide that under their payment, Donna, correct? They, we slide that under their employment contract, now the extra, oh, six, seven, eight grand that they would make a year. Now, now he's an employee, no longer an independent contract. Now all these laws apply, even though they're coaching a team. Yes, he's still he's our employee, whether he's coaching or whether he's in the office. In that example, if he were, if now he's under my control, yes, hundred percent, one hundred percent. Okay. Now hold on, uh, let me let can further clarify, Please, yeah. because um, uh, we we've, we've just now you know modified our our payment structure. Stand up, so I'm going through a trophy. Um, so, and, and some people in here, it could be um, slid into their position description that they are going to coach a team. Uh, in mine, for example, it is not. And to all your examples about an independent contractor and, the, and really the, the tie being with the coach <coughs> and the team, even though I am an employee of the club, my relationship with the team is separate from that. It is in addition to my position uh, with the club. At that point, 
um, understanding, yes, I'm, I'm wearing the logo, people recognize me <coughs> as an employee, but in a certain context, I am, would be technically considered an independent contractor at that moment. Is it still one and the same, or do I fall under that independent contract? Okay, you can be, you could wear dual hats. You could be an employee in certain contexts. And when you're an employee, you have the protections of Title VII. When you're an independent contractor, you don't have the protections because you're not an employee. If you engage in harassment as an independent contractor, we can fire you because you, for whatever reason, because we can control the quality, you're the plumber, we can control the quality of the way you do your job. As an employee, we can discipline you and fire you for sexual harassment as well. So if you're the, the one engaging in the conduct, if you're the <coughs> victim and you're har being harassed while you're in the office, you have the protections of the law. If you're an independent contractor and you're being harassed based on a protected category, you don't have the protections of the law because you're not an employee. Now, you could sue for assault and battery if you were physically harmed or verbally harmed. You could sue in tort if you could come up with a theory that you could recover on, under, but not under Title VII. If I was um, um, at fault, so not the victim, but if I was at fault, um, when I am uh, I'm traveling with my team, <coughs> um, at that point, the, the team who is paying my stipend, the team who is covering my expenses for that trip, not the club, um, and I uh, am guilty of harassment in, in, on that case. I could be fired um, from the club or by the team, but that doesn't necessarily um, impact my employment. I could be fired from the team but not fired from my job, is that correct? No, you could actually be fired from both. Mm -hmm. and the re reason is you, you wear dual hats, but obviously what you're doing, I gave the Bronco game as an example. If we did a, if we wanted you to go entertain a bunch of clients at the Bronco game and you were a jerk to those clients at the game, we could fire you for that. Because you, even though it's off duty, technically, and you're at a game, a social event, you still have the cloak of the organization on you. And so I, I, it's confusing. You can be fired from the team, clearly, but your conduct still violates, theoretically, the, the mission statement of the organization, which is when you carry yourself in public wearing the Rush logo and brand, you, you're, you have an obligation to the company to you know, do things that, that are appropriate. And so the company could fire you for engaging in conduct that's unbecoming of a Rush employee off the job, technically. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So a couple examples. Male supervisor turns to a female subordinate, tilts his head and says with a smile, hmm, nice, you've been working out, haven't you? Harassment? Sure. Maybe? Is she offended? We gotta ask her. We'd have to ask her. From the just from the view of this picture here, it's inappropriate, right? So if you saw that happen, you would think that's not appropriate. Is it sexual harassment? Probably not. Without more facts, because it's not severe or pervasive, as Dom suggests. We we need more than that. Uh, we can discipline this person for it. So if you saw this kind of conduct. We have a reporting mechanism in the handbook. You could rep report it to that person's supervisor. Hey, I saw this. Supervisor, once you learn of it, you have an obligation to sit him down and say, probably not the best thing to do. Um, you know, looking, and it's just not her, because if you saw that happening to your coworker, you could be offended that the person's doing it. So just, uh, and then again, I threw in the two, the two men example. If it were two men, does it change the equation? Not at all, really. It's the same exact analysis, whether they meet the criteria uh, to, to get to the level of harassment, uh, but it doesn't matter whether. So who can be a, a harasser? Um, so this will probably throw up a question. Who can be a harasser? Uh, obviously, managers or supervisors. They can harass. Co-employees can harass. but. Our folks can also be harassed by 
our customers, the UPS delivery driver. Uh, I've had a number of cases like that where the, the customer, you know, if, if a parent said I was harassed by my coach sexually, what do we do? How would we handle that? I would call their supervisor and get out of the middle. Yeah. <laughs> no, so you, you have to address it. You do have, you to, have address to address it. it. And to find out, and you got to be careful. Immediately call this person guilty because who, who knows what's behind? Gotta, that's right. That's right. Research. That's right. We we have a duty to investigate. We want to treat the accused with as much dignity and respect right. as the victim because yeah, right. we don't know who's right until you investigate. Now, a visitor, customer, parent isn't going to have the same rights under the law because they're not our employees, right? They can be victims of the coaches or a permanent employee of harassment. It doesn't mean that it is in fact harassment, but if we were to determine that they did engage in harassment, then we would have a right to discipline them. Again, it's that cloak of that image that the person holds while they're out coaching that gives us the right to touch them even if they're not in the employment relationship. So just from, from that, your last statement there, if I've got a, a parent of a U6, uh, I've got a U6 boy on the team, and they are abusive to Roberta during the registration process, um, obviously I've got a, an obligation to, to investigate um, I'm within my I'm right within my rights to, to terminate their relationship with the club at that point. With, with the parent and their mm -hmm. child? Yeah. 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 I mean I again it's you know it's it's a um, it, it is a little bit of a tightrope because <coughs> ultimately we, we want you've got to have customers, right? And we thrive off referrals, right? And we thrive off the professionalism that the organization gives to the to the public. And so you you have a duty to investigate because we have a duty to protect her from abusive conduct. And if you find it's abusive, the question is, as a, as a business, not legal question, but a business question, do we immediately terminate once we conclude that there's <laughs> more likelihood than not that the person engaged in abusive conduct? I mean, is it a zero tolerance game, or do we go to the parent and say, listen, we think you've been abusive. If you're abusive again, you need to know that you're out of here and your kid's out of here. Uh, I think that's a business judgment. I think it's going to depend on the type of abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's tending on violence, probably zero tolerance. You know, physical, uh, a, you know, that kind of crazy agitation. Those kind of people generally break. What's their legal recourse at that point? They disagree. They say, you know, uh, Roberta was uh, copying an attitude. She provoked the whole thing. And, uh, um, after I investigate, I say, no, you're, you're out of here. And what's the club's liability there? there, there's, there it's contractual yeah. because they've paid money. Uh -huh. I suspect that in all those cases we just refund the money to get rid of them. I mean, you could technically you could hold the money, but for 600 bucks, it's, it's worth just saying, hey, take your money and leave. Mm -hmm. That's what I would recommend. All right, so a co-worker and volunteer fireman frequently appears as Mr. December in one of those fireman calendars that considered something of a ladies' man. He often flirts with the new female employees who reject, who rarely object. He also brags about his sexual ex exploits, but only when he's around other men. Uh, is that harassment? Again, it's probably. not. It's not because it doesn't it doesn't match the, the criteria. Right. Probably not. Uh, probably not a good idea for anyone to talk about their sexual exploits in in an open public room and with co-workers, um, the, you know, being in the calendar, I mean, the only reason that I, these are notable is that uh, these guys are often getting disciplined for being in the calendars, and so there's been a lot of litigation around the country. Can they be, uh, you know, this is kind of that conduct on becoming a fireman, and there are a lot of cases there. It's a different equation for them because they're, generally speaking, public employees. And so under, if they're working for the government, they have protections under the Constitution. And so there's a whole debate over whether they have the right First Amendment to, to pose and whether you can uh, nab them for what they're doing in their off-duty time. 
All right. So it doesn't matter um, in the case that the person who engages in the harassment, you know, had a noble reason for doing what they did. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear as many excuses as, as that person can give. I was trying to be funny. You know, everyone else was laughing in the room. Um, I didn't intend it to be offensive. You know, the best, the, the better part of valor for anyone that gets caught up in this snag is to go immediately and apologize and never engage in the conduct again. So if you do something that's inappropriate, you know, just own up to it, say, I'm sorry, and move forward. So, uh, <laughs> this is Tim in his better days, or uh, early right there. <laughs> So, the mailman, while delivering mail to Rush's office, frequently makes comments about physical attributes of one of the female employees, such as nice eyes, or referring to her chest. Uh, if she were a package, I'd love to open open it. Um, is that harassment? Yeah, probably. Um, because it's, the, you know, there's there's both verbal and nonverbal looks. Again, is it se severe, pervasive? Mm -hmm. Probably not. What do we do if that were to happen here? we would contact the post office and tell them not to have this guy come back to our organization anymore. So okay, so they say, tough. That's it. Our employee will do what we want. Well, you how, does, how does that affect, you got a different, can, can, my, can, can my employee get upset with me because that guy keeps coming back? Hey, I told him, Eric, I told him not, I told yes. him the post office. The answer is yes. So, um, so Eric can get, <laughs> You can come at me as a... I, I'll, I'll t this could actually has happened quite a bit because um, I represent UPS and this happens quite a bit for us. We do investigate the issue and if, <coughs> even, if even in the case where there's no proof, oftentimes as an accommodation, and many private employers will accommodate the request that you know they won't send that person out. I think if it's the post office, which is probably not the best example, because you you know there's going to be a lot more a lot more difficulty causing the government to yeah but my maybe. question is I don't do anything Eric just deal with you know Eric he got the plane post office came to him and they were doing you know some harassment with him Eric comes to me and says some advice so Eric deal with it can Eric sue he us? can sue us yeah our duty at that point if the post office for instance said no would be to then move okay. Eric out of the area when that guy arrives, because you can't force someone to have to be subjected to severe and pervasive conduct. Because this 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 kind of this happens a little bit where a parent comes in here and goes, Berta, you know this club sucks," or even on the phone, bad language, the f bomb. I tell him, I said, "Listen, hang up on him." I mean, now you go back to the business side of things. But if I don't do anything, <laughs> Berta can come that, to me and say, "I'm example. tired of this club," and Tim, you're doing nothing about it. Johnny, Johnny, dad of Johnny, keeps doing this, and you do nothing about it. I can get in trouble. Well, it's a different. That's a different question because in that context, you're not. It's not based on a protected category. It's not someone engaging in the conduct for the purpose of discrimination on okay. the basis of their sex. They're just abusive conduct. Okay. And subjecting our employees to that, I mean, that to some degree, and I apologize, but I suspect you have to deal with that um, on occasion. Because we do have frustrated parents, and that comes with the territory a little bit. Okay. Um, I think again, it comes down to that: what's our ongoing relationship going to be with an abusive person? And I think as a club, you would say we don't need to have that relationship. We don't want you in the club, so move on. Kind of like with the beef. Yes. Sawyer, we have a certain set of parents that have had issues with the like, last two, three seasons that Ross and Don have dealt with. Yeah. Even with the state, it's just... It, it becomes too much. I mean, it's really just a business judgment. Okay. We can we can eliminate them, because they have no rights to be part participants in the club, <clears throat> right? I just, you know, our job is to protect the club, right? Uh, upper management. Yeah. So i got to make sure that I, I... Even if it is sexual harassment, I need to listen to Berta because Mr. Johnny came in and did X, Y, Z. I need to make sure that I'm following through with that's right. her request to look into it. That's right. And that's why, if you look, if you read the policy, it speaks to this, that we, uh, it includes all aspects of the operation. Our duty to protect someone from unlawful harassment, um, whether it's a parent, vendor, 
or coworker. Um, so I said earlier that we um, uh, have a no tolerance. One of the things that you know any supervisor knows is there's also a, a duty that you have under the policies to, to step in if you become aware of a potential problem that you're raising it up the chain of command because you have a responsibility as a supervisor and you can be disciplined for your failure to report, hey, my best friend Ross did something, but I'm not going to turn him in because he's my best friend. If I did that, I could be disciplined just as he could be disciplined for him engaging in the conduct, me engaging in the cover, right? So again, remember, you have that duty to report. All right, so I gave a couple examples here. On a Friday afternoon after work, a number of employees go to a local bar. An employee goes to a supervisor and says, I don't want to make a big deal about this, but I'd like to talk to you about something that's been going on at work. Please don't tell anyone. And then they proceed to tell you that, you know, Tim asked me out on a date and made me uncomfortable. What do I do? Um, what's your duty as a supervisor? Now, I'll assume that this is not a sanctioned event. It's you guys just got together on a Friday afternoon and said, hey, let's go out and have a cocktail. So it's not a sanctioned rush event. Do you have a duty to do anything as a supervisor about this? If you feel it violates the, uh, uh, this, this, this criteria. Yeah, yeah. criteria. Well, the, the answer is yes. Um, you have a duty. It, it never matters whether the victim says to you, I don't want this to go any further than this. I want you to keep it quiet because they feel confident. Um, if you keep it quiet and you don't do something and, and run it up the chain of command, it causes a problem for the company because your knowledge as a supervisor is imputed to the organization. So once you knew, you had a duty to look into it. So the, the appropriate thing is to hear, just tell the person, you know, I'm really sorry that happened. I, 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 I really have to tell you that I have a responsibility to report this to, to management. I'll, I'll make sure that they understand you told me under confidence, uh, and I'm sorry, but that's what we're going to have to do. That's the way you deal with it, um, because you don't have the right to, to keep it secret. All right, so while attending the company's holiday party, you see another employee drinking heavily and flirting with a coworker. When he dances with her, his hands roam all over her. She appears uncomfortable, but is smiling as, as though going along. What do you do in that circumstance? I'd say nothing to consenting adults. What's that? That tells us to knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, actual, the answer to this is that you probably do have a, a responsibility here. Um, the first thing that probably needs to take place, especially if it's a supervisor subordinate situation, is to go to the subordinates and say, Are you okay? Things okay, um, you know. Sometimes the victim's not going to just come out and say it's uncomfortable, um, and so even if you got the the a okay, it probably is not something we need to tolerate. So you could go to the the other consenting person here that you're at least thinking they're consent, the one that's doing the conduct, and say, um, "Hey, you know, it's probably not a good idea. Uh, be careful." Uh, but this would trigger our responsibility especially if the outward signs of what the guy is doing, the hands all over the body, you subjectively view her as being uncomfortable, those are indicators of harassment. So we'd want to look at that. All right, so the, the bottom line lesson learned is that harassment can occur anywhere. It doesn't have to be within the confines and the four walls of the building. It could be anywhere, and so we just have to be mindful of that as long as it's, uh, you know, tied to the workplace. A couple more examples. A non-supervisory employee tells a co-worker the opposite sex, you look nice today. The co-worker then complains. All right. Why is this one? Everyone shakes their head no. Uh, this is actually happens frequently where you, you get these kinds of complaints and you look, you look and you say, Okay, this doesn't make any sense. Um, again, we look to the reasonable person standard. I had already said this earlier, but you look to the reasonable person standard. You say, you know, would a reasonable person really be upset about that? The way we would deal with it internally is we would tell the, the person who complained, 
we don't find that to be harassment, but we'll talk to the employee. And of course, I can tell you what's going to happen. The employee is never going to say a nice thing again about that coworker. Well, it has to be addressed. You have to address it, even though it's not harassment. So, um, why, why why would you have to address it when it was a a, a one-time thing and to a reasonable person? You know, if I said, "Okay, you know, it doesn't seem out of line. If it should happen again, you feel the same way, then let me know. Could could that suffice? That suffices. Yeah, you got to address it. I mean, first of all, remember, in the context of harassment, it's dignity and respect to the accused, dignity and respect to the accuser. And so even if we conclude the accuser is oversensitive, we still have a duty to address it. And the way you just did is the exact way you should do it, very artfully, and say, I don't find that to be offensive. If it, if it happens again and you're uncomfortable, you know, I'll raise it up the chain of command. And frankly, my advice is you don't even have to go to the accused in that context, although you probably should, right? You you don't have to because if you when, once you go to the accused, it's going to cause friction, right? And you don't want retaliation because she is protected from about, you know, she can complain. Uh, even if it's unreasonable, she can complain. So you don't want the, um, the accused to to retaliate. So if you address it with him, you have to remind him, hey, probably not a good idea to say anything of that nature. Remember, you can't engage in retaliation, so don't try. you got to really make a concerted effort not to treat her any differently. So I, I, I put a couple things about, um, oops, um, things about conduct that I think are, in, in layman's terms, you know, the, the way to kind of test what you're doing and whether it, it's appropriate. And so I said, uh, these two, three tests, your child's test, the newspaper test, and the parent test. So ask yourself when you, when you engage in conduct or you're looking at something, someone's conduct, what would your child say? Uh, how would you feel if that type of conduct was reported in the newspaper? Or alternatively, what would your parents say about the conduct? If, if you pass those three tests, then your conduct probably isn't offensive. Um, but most people can't get past one or more of these tests when they, when they do a self-awareness of what they're doing in the workplace. So just kind of remember those as a... As a, as a and those questions got to be asked by the reasonable person because when you're dealing with children, many of our parents are incredibly unreasonable because you fail every, all three of those tests every single time for the unreasonable parent. Yeah, a bit, a bit of a different context, but you're right. I understand that. I think it's when I'm what I'm speaking of is you know your conduct as it's directed to that coworker, um, when you know the statements that you're making. If that stuff, you know, how are you going to feel when that stuff's reported? So and so did this towards you know this employee. Um, your policy. Here's the um, uh, reporting mechanism. So this is straight uh, taken straight from my book. Yes. Okay. Um, I believe uh, verbatim, okay. if I'm not mistaken. So again, remember there is a reporting mechanism in in the policy that speaks to what you say and, and how to report it to the supervisor. And retaliation. Just we're going to quickly go over this one and then we'll be done and take any questions. This is also known as the whistleblower. Uh, yeah. Well. I call it a whistleblower because the context of why these retaliation laws were created were originally to protect whistleblowers, um, and they're they're tied to many of our statutes. So in Title VII, for instance, you have a right to raise a complaint of discrimination, and when you do, you're protected from unlawful retaliation. So we, as a club, have a policy that prohibits uh, retaliation. We also are mandated by law to prohibit retaliation. So when does retaliation exist? Um, when there is a protected activity, the, the complaining witness, or the, the, either the victim or the witness, engages in protected activity. That can be through a complaint or through participation in our investigation. So if, if I'm the victim and I say I've been, engaged, I've been harassed, we investigate. 
and, and you say, well, tell me who, who witnessed it, and I say, well, these ten people witnessed it. The, once I go interview those ten people, those ten and me are protected from retaliation because we've all engaged in protected activity. Um, if we suffer material adverse action in our employment, remember the tangible employment action, change to the terms and conditions of employment, then that's another element of retaliation because that's the, that's the actual act of retaliating. Once that occurs and there's a causal connection, in other words, you prove that I suffered the tangible employment action, demotion, loss of pay, loss of job, because you were motivated to retaliate against me for engaging in the protected activity, then I have an independent claim against the company called retaliation. Okay, so um, remember what I said earlier though, even if we determine as a company that the complaint was invalid or it didn't have enough merit to, to warrant um, us to do anything other than tell the accused, hey, we remind you about our policies. We're not going to find you to have violated our policies, but we just want to remind you that they're here. And we tell the victim there wasn't enough for us to, to discipline the employee um, because we determined that it was not as likely as you said that that it happened the way you described. Um, again, it doesn't have to be truthful. It, as long as they engage in the protected activity, and in this context it's the ten witnesses and the, the, the victim coming forward and making a complaint, they're protected against retaliation. All right? So that in a nutshell, guys, is the laws that uh, prohibit harassment in the workplace. And um, if you have any questions, since I'm here, I promised Tim I'd answer any uh, any labor and employment questions general, even if they're outside the harassment context. What about provocation? Like for example, in sexual harassment, is uh, the the supposedly uh, harasser says as well. She provoked you. How 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 do you deal? How would how, how yeah I would can manage the situation. So if the so if I understand the question, you would, the defense that the accused gives is the victim provoked her. Yes. Um, and let me be bold here and give an example to see if it's kind of what you're asking. So if I said the way she dressed provoked me to harass her. This might be one, and verbally too. So, okay. for example, I uh, I stop my uh, um, verbiage and look like the the, the receiver of my uh, verbiage accept this, and, uh, and uh, she's playing with, and I go further and uh, and uh, look like she's okay, and and then it happened that's I uh, I become a lesson. Good question. Um, because it's the slippery slope effect. Um, what, what I found is, of course, nine times out of ten, the person who's subjected to the verbal harassment doesn't say no. And no matter how much training I've given to employers, I can never get the employees to come forward and actually do what is the most appropriate thing when you're subjected to harassment, is to look at the person making the statements and tell them, I don't accept that. Don't treat me that way. Don't say that to me. That's the first thing you can do as a victim. But the problem is most victims don't do that. So they take it. And the accused comes back and says, I thought they were participating in it because they, they kept taking it. And what, what I found is, of course, you, you, the harassment grows in severity. And as it grows and no one says anything, the victim doesn't say anything, it becomes severe and pervasive. It's offensive because we have to look in the mind of the, the person, the recipient of the, the statements, right? If she says it's offensive, that's the first step. If we place another person in that person's shoes, the reasonable person, and we say, how would they re feel? Once we prove it's unwelcome, it's of a gender-based nature, it's sexual, then you have harassment. If, however, the conduct, the provocation, is it was banter back and forth between two people. The, that becomes an issue of whether it's unwelcome or not. So if you said a statement about 
some sexual exploit. The victim then responds with a similar statement about sexual exploits. It's going to be we're going to be hard pressed as a company to say that that's unwelcome conduct because both of them are engaging in what really is inappropriate in the workplace. Does that make sense? Yeah. My, the the question uh, I think it's probably to make this question is a movie uh, back in the days of Jody Foster that was in the bar and uh, they were playing billiard and uh, the girl uh, they subject to some verbiage uh, appreciation and uh, she looked like she. Uh, she liked that kind of situation, and then when uh, when uh, the, the the man main character of the of the movie started to make the dance, and, and that she she didn't like it, and she had been assaulted basically, but the assaulter uh, didn't get punished. That's why. Mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's, it, it's the same here because we we can't we can never blame a victim, unfortunately, and well I shouldn't even say unfortunately we can't blame a victim because the victim didn't get up and stand up for their own rights. Our duty as a company is to make make the environment free of harassment, right? And so, you you can't you can't blame a victim as a matter of a matter of policy. It it's either harassment or it isn't. And the first comment may not be harassment because it's not so severe and pervasive, right? The second or two or three, as you're going down the hill or slope, it becomes offensive. And so once we get as a company and we analyze the conduct. We're never going to blame the victim. We can look to the victim's conduct to determine whether the victim was consenting to it. And the only way to get there, since I don't know the movie you're talking about, would be to look at what the victim said in response. And so if the victim was engaging in the banter as well, the victim's going to have a hard time coming back saying, I, it was really offensive and unwelcome. Right? So it becomes a grayer area for you. So I, I suppose the, the answer is if the provocation is enough to cause the company to determine that it was consensual, then you don't have a harassment situation. I suspect almost in every circumstance that we could come up with or deviation of facts, we're going to conclude that there's enough merit there to at least discipline both of you by reminding the, the accused, we have these policies, if we ever see it again, you're out of here, and to the victim, we've looked into it, and we respect that you were offended, but, you know, there wasn't enough for us to go on because there wasn't two other witnesses who observed it, and it's your word against his. We've disciplined him by reminding him that if he engages in the conduct again, we could terminate So in this case, that witness had a huge... Would have a huge impact, because the witness would serve as a reasonable person, too, and would be able to tell us what they observed in the conduct. Yes, sir. Plus a, a criminal act trumps everything. Um, no, the movie he's talking about was a criminal act. Well, there's a rape, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So it, it trumps everything anyway. It, it, it does. I mean, the, obviously the rape, there's going to be a criminal repercussion to it. And, and under, under evidentiary law, the victim's background is never relevant in a rape context. Yeah. Because we, as a matter of public policy, we've determined that the promiscuity of the victim is never admissible to, sh to show that they consented. Um, but if a circumstance occurred where there was a criminal act, you're right, there's going to be a criminal repercussion, but we also have the right to, to discipline as an employer. So we, if someone got accused of rape, we would probably terminate their employment, even while the allegations are pending, because we're, we're not subject to the proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, as a, the only kind of elements of proof that we have to worry about is good faith. If we find, as a matter of good faith, no matter how low the evidence is, as long as we are motivated out of a desire to rid the environment of discrimination, we can act. So we don't have to say it's preponderance of the evidence, 51%, beyond a reasonable doubt, 90%. Uh, we can just determine as a private employer what our remedy is. I have a question that uh, I was personally involved in. What happens if the employer uses the at, at, at will mm -hmm. um, law just to get rid of them? Um, it, well, Colorado, like many states, uh, is an at will state. And um, what that means is you 
and the company have the right to separate the relationship regardless of the reason. Um, it can't be an illegal reason, right? So if you could have proved in your example that you were terminated because of your race mm -hmm. or your gender or your religion, um, at will doesn't trump that, okay? At will means I can terminate you for any reason, but not an illegal reason. So if I retaliated against you in terminating you, you'd have an actionable claim. Um, I think at will is really more known today for the exceptions to that will. And, you know, discrimination claims are an exception. Right. Another one. Well, it's almost like the retaliation before. Wes gives me a promotion and Ross is all bummed out about it. And then he starts accusing me of stuff that hasn't been happening. So, like, almost the retaliation is before the first part. How does that come into it? Um, so if you're if you're promoted, the guy's upset that you got the promotion. So he so also accuse me of stuff that yeah. So he makes a false allegation against you. Um, you know, it depends on the way I would start with the analysis. We'd look to what the allegation is. So if it was a allegation of harassment, right? We're going to investigate. If we can determine that he made the allegation, knowing it to be false. We can terminate him, and of course you wouldn't be subject to any discipline, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, if he's just engaging in, I'm upset you you won the contest, and it's it's inappropriate. It's probably not unlawful under Title VII, but it's unlawful under our policies that our employees treat everyone with dignity and respect. So we wouldn't investigate it as a discrimination claim. We would investigate it as a violation of policy and say, we think Ross is engaging in this as, as a form of, of, you know, being uncivil. And that violates the policies of, of pe treating people with dignity. <coughs> I have a question on all these posters. Oh, oh that, yes. That they keep calling me saying, oh, we've updated laws. I mean, because they're expensive. Expensive. Or is that something, I mean, every time a law does change? Do I have to buy those posters for all three locations? Um, can, we, can we take a black magic mark and write it below this new yeah. one? <laughs> um, they're, they're like 200 bucks a pop. <laughs> they are expensive, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, you can get caught for a record keeping, uh, okay. a posting violation. Because, you know, if they ever came in and audited us, mm -hmm. whether it's DOL or, or anyone else, they, the first thing they look at is our posters, okay. just to make sure they're up. Um, you don't have to necessarily buy them from them, but it's like the most convenient and easy source of posters. <clears throat> so um, there's really no way around that, unfortunately. Okay. Just because I know they're calling me now, and I that kind of put them off for a little bit. That's an easy source of income. 200 bucks for what cost? Well, know, yeah, because it's $600 then, because you have to post them down there. So, okay. Well, you could you could um, make this place the one source of, of an employee's break room. I don't, where are the other facilities? Colorado Springs. Oh, okay. there. you have a choice. So. All right. Anything could I, else? Could I ask one? Yep. Um, you know, it, I, I'm curious. Is and this maybe is a little bit of a of a cynical uh, approach. So I apologize in advance, but you know, curious as to to me what the the process is. For somebody who wants to um, put forth a, a claim, and the, the cynical part is, you know, there could be somebody in here right now who's a, a disgruntled employee, and now they're they're looking for something, um, and so now I I reach a bit and feel that here is a way for me to either. Um, Get maybe it's not a promotion, but maybe it's I stake a claim. Is there is there money involved? You know, etc. Because I'm going to reach. I can make this stick now. I think you've already said many times that the severity of it um, comes into account, uh, the consistency of it. You know, uh, you know, if it's a one-off, chances are it it doesn't seem to me that things are going to to stick or it's going to go too far. It has to be consistent, it has to be severe to the reasonable person, etc., etc., etc. But if I'm the, the, the person now, I'm a disgruntled employee, 
And I want to say that, well, I think Tim's doing this, um, whether I truly believe it or not, I think I can make this claim that based upon my religion, you know, Tim is doing this to me, and so I'm going to go after him. You know, what is the, the typical process? And I've not been fired, um, but I'm looking for some retribution somehow. Um, what, what point does it go beyond Tim to our board? What point does um, a lawyer come into play and it, it reach outside the scope of, of our club? Uh, money that's involved, length of time, success. Can you address some of that, some of the, the process? Yeah, the, um, the typical process, you've raised about 30 questions in Sorry. your comments, so I'll give you uh, an overview of the process. I mean, there, I, I would start off by saying, um, you know, when does a lawyer get involved? And I think you'd be surprised that lawyers work for the company and are involved a lot in claims that you probably have no idea that the lawyer has actually been involved giving consultation about. Um, and it's just that's just good management. It, it doesn't necessarily mean, and fortunately for Rush, they've been able to get folks like me who are willing to do things on a reduced basis or a pro bono basis. Um, the, the process by which someone would follow to, to file a claim would be first to do it internally because uh, the reason we do training like this is to give us a safe harbor if there's harassment going on. Because we can come back and tell the aggrieved person when they file a claim, you never complain to us. You can't require us to do anything if you don't first come forward and make a complaint. And the law says you're absolutely right. If you can prove that the person knew about the policies of the company, they were oriented to them, they understood that you had an equal employment, uh, no discrimination policy, and they failed to take advantage of the protective mechanisms that the company had, there's no liability. So that's why we do training. Um, if the person first files a complaint internally and they're not happy with it, then they have to go and exhaust their remedies either at the state level or the federal level. So they would have to formalize a complaint of discrimination under oath with an agency who is then empowered to investigate it. That process, depending on the agency, can take a year or more. It's fairly inexpensive to get through the administrative process because it's usually the person goes down, they swear to the conduct, the investigator comes and looks at the records, we make a personal statement and you know, probably take some sworn statements from people who are witnesses. Um, the agency then makes a finding. The finding is either going to be there was probable cause to believe discrimination occurred or there's no probable cause. In either case, 99.9% .9 of the time the agency is going to leave it alone at that point. The, our agencies are not equipped with manpower or money to sue a private employer. So they usually throw it back in either case and say, okay, employee, we couldn't... We either found there was probable cause or we didn't, but in either case, you have a right to go file a claim. So the employee then has an obligation to, to one, they, they can either file a claim on their own behalf, which some people do, not very artfully, but they do, um, in a court that has jurisdiction to hear that kind of claim. Um, our state courts have jurisdiction to hear it, uh, as, as does our federal court. And so a claim would usually be filed in the court system, and that process can take two to three to four years depending on the judge um, and there's a you know a process in the court system when you can actually take all the evidence to the court and tell the court this case doesn't need to go to a jury trial because we know that if we try it ten times the results gonna be X because the facts are undisputed that this is what happened and the judge takes a look at it and either takes it away from the jury and the case is over or lets the case proceed to jury and if it goes to jury, you know, then it's a it's an expensive endeavor. Um, you know, I don't think I give a budget. I mean, just to give you a ballpark uh, for a litigation file anymore that's under three hundred thousand dollars. There, it's an expensive process, and companies are either willing to take that risk or not. Um, most cases in this area settle for some value. Um, you know. A, claim out of here would not be major value because you know most of the folks here 
um, while compensated, I think, fairly comparatively to other clubs or not highly compensated people, where you start adding damages. And the problem with employment claims is it's if it's a federal claim, you get the damages if you're no longer employed, you get the damages from the date of termination to the date of trial, and then you get damages going forward to put you back in the position you would have been in but for the discrimination. So those are your economic losses, back pay and front pay. You then get damages for any damage associated with the non-tangible side, the emotional distress, so you get compensatory losses. So most discrimination victims will claim, I suffered some form of depression or distress, therefore you have to give me that, that money payment for that. And that's fairly small value. They get their lawyer's fees paid by the company, who it's not the other way around in, in, in our civil rights laws. And then they get punitive damages on top of it, all dependent on the size of the company. Uh, so, you know, frankly, in a, in a claim coming out of this company, I don't think it would be significant enough to, to probably warrant going all the way to the mat. But, uh, you know, it's a process that's provided for by law. There's nothing we can do about it, no matter how much we <coughs> dislike what the law has caused to occur today, meaning there are a number of claims that are filed that don't have a lot of merit. Uh, but I think the organization would be in a position to decide if it has merit, do we try to settle it early? If it doesn't have merit, do we try to fight it because of principle or some other reason? But it can be a long process. It can be a three or four year process. It can cause a lot of strife internally. And that's why you know the, be the best thing that we can do for each other is just eliminate harassment from occurring in the first place. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. And those are the old adages you've heard your mother say a thousand times. And it means something in the workplace. And whether I'm the um, uh, victim or the accused, and maybe this is a question for Tim or Donna, but whether I'm the, the victim or the accused, um, I am covered here by the the club, and if it got to a point where I needed um, representation, I'm covered. Well, if you go back to the early part of the presentation, the the answer to the question is, you you wouldn't you're not going to get sued, right, unless you get sued under one of those claims that can go after you individually. If you didn't engage in the conduct, then as long as there's no conflict of interest between you and the company, then the, I, I can't imagine a circumstance where the, the interest that the club wouldn't otherwise protect you. You know, I can't speak to every circumstance that applies because it, all facts are different, but the first analysis any lawyer would have to do is whether your interests are different and whether there's a, there's a risk. You would sit down with a lawyer and you would tell them what you did, and if the lawyer thought that there was a risk of individual liability, then you might be in a circumstance where you'd be out on your own. Um, those are rare. It's possible, but rare. We do have a uh, coverage of policy coverage through the state association on lawsuits based on these, uh, yes. these criteria. I don't know the policy inside and out, but um, we have probably been through it five, six times in the past 20 years right. where somebody has been suing the organization or an employee in the state has to step up because we have insurance under that right. under those uh, categories. But that's outside in. You know, one clarification would be that um, not talking about, because we're talking about within our workplace right now, you know, so conceivably the company would find itself on, on both sides or the company may not know which side to support? No, you'd be surprised. I mean, if you're the if you're the accused, it, it's a, a very rare circumstance. I mean, less than five cases in 20 years where we've had to tell the employee we can't represent him because our interests are aligned. I mean, if the defense is that no harassment occurred, it wasn't severe or pervasive, even if you engaged in offensive conduct, and we don't think they can prove the elements of the claim, then your interests are still aligned. They're not divergent, but it's, a, it's an ethics issue for, for a lawyer because the insurance company that would hire the lawyer to represent the, the club has to decide whether they can represent you too. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about it, uh, but 
you're, you're right. I mean, the, the policy applies for the club and, you know, conduct in the course and scope of your employment. I have a question just on employee, employer. You know, obviously there's some disciplinary things that would lead to immediate termination. Um, other things, let's just say, for instance, I don't know your conduct within the office, but we don't think it's appropriate, so we try and counsel you on that. How many times do you need to do the counseling and finally say, you know what, this just isn't working out, you're not the right employee for us, without the, because I think you know we're on an unemployment bond instead of paying, paying unemployment mm -hmm. insurance right now. And typically, the unemployment usually does side with the employee, but there are cases that, you know, we can say, hey, listen, we've done everything. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. There is no there is no requirement that there be any number of warnings or progressive discipline. In the unemployment context, because of the way the system is designed, it favors employees over employers. Um, but if you can document that you warned thoroughly what specifically about the conduct was inappropriate, and you gave an opportunity for that person to improve, and they didn't, then you should, under state law, be able to succeed in an unemployment claim, because the termination would not be the fault of the employer. You know, what I would tell you is that, is a single discipline enough? Almost not, right. in the unemployment three. context. Mm -hmm. I think two or three is sufficient. And I was going to ask the question on that, Steve. Can, do you have the right to say you're terminated for one week, you're without pay, you're... Yes. You can do that. Okay. You can suspend someone for a week. They're not terminated, you're just suspending them as a disciplinary method. But you could, uh, on the unemployment side, I mean, it, it's all about the documentation. Right. It's all about the sitting down and what you're counseling. orally counseling them about, you know. And, and it can't be different situations each time. Right. Right. It needs to be the same situation that and causes. say they're doing something else now. Now they're coming in tardy or late. So now, now you have to counsel them on that That's three right. times. That's right. Well, very good. As, as, as Steve had uh, mentioned, that um, this is pro bono work here today. So, um, uh, we're, on behalf of the club, we're very much appreciative of your time and effort. Um, Steve had recommended that you sign this um, uh, paper that you, came, that you came to the course or the seminar. Uh, it's a little bit of protection for us that you're aware of your rights. There's a handbook. It's alluded to many times, there's a handbook that we abide by. Um, your rights, your protections. Very fine line between our coaches and you know what their rights are with uh, their or their part-time employees. Um, some, maybe another another time, another subject. What Mike's rights are and obligations are there to report to us what's going on with his.